This is House Talk with Wally and Cindy Kerr. Today's real estate podcast is presented by Chris Doak with Gateway Mortgage and Best Protect Roofing and Construction. You can catch all of the previous shows and podcasts by visiting the library of topics at wallytalkshouses.com. Let's join Wally and Cindy for this week's podcast. Hey, welcome to our show this week. It is the week of Thanksgiving. It is, and happy Thanksgiving this week. And Wally, I want to start off by asking you about your most memorable Thanksgiving tradition in childhood. Well, besides the great turkey giblet gravy that my Aunt Pat used to make, which was absolutely fantastic and the stuffing was great. Okay, so my my Thanksgiving as a child, as a youth, was all centered around OU football, believe it or not. (laughs) She's rolling her eyes. Here we go. So every weekend when I was a teen or young, OU always played Nebraska that weekend. And so the happiness of Thanksgiving was totally affected by that game. If we lost, (laughs) it was a rotten Thanksgiving. But if uh, we won, of course, you were celebratory all weekend long. So that's that's kind of my memory of, of Thanksgiving as a youth. What about yours, Cindy? You know, my memory is centered around football, too. Uh, oh, yeah, no right. kidding. Not. <laughs> <laughs> no, I grew up in, a, in an Italian household. My family was Italian. And so they had a lot of really traditional meals that were purchased at the Italian store, risotto and dried mushrooms from Italy and antipasto. It was delicious, and it was fun to have those real Italian cultural meals. So you told me before that your nanny, of course, was full Italian. And as a child, because I asked you once we met, how much Italian do you know? And you said, well, that's kind of faded away over the years, but your nanny used to talk to your mom in full Italian. Is that's that right. right. And then you witnessed that? How did that all work out? Well, my grandmother would come stay with us, my nanny, in the summertime. And she would ask my mom questions in Italian, but my mother always answered in English. So I was in half the conversation. So did that make your grandma angry that your mom would answer in English? Did she want her to talk more Italian? You know, I don't know because my grandmother mostly spoke Italian. So I really didn't get to ask her. Now, my aunt, my mother's older sister, was born in Italy, and she would answer my grandmother in Italian. So I was totally left out of those conversations. Do you know the story behind how your grandparents immigrated here? You know, it's, I'll tell you this, it's really interesting. My nanny's husband came here because it was a tough time in the world back at the time they came. And when would that have been? And that would have been in the 20s, 1920s. And he said, I'm going to go to the land of opportunity. He got on a ship and he came to America. And my grandmother, my nanny, was in Italy, in northern Italy, and she was totally opposed to this. And of course, there was no internet, not even phone. They were writing letters. But my grandmother apparently was so opposed to this, she said, come back. I don't want to go to America. And my grandfather went ahead and wrote my grandmother a letter and said, I am not coming back. You come here. And she did. And so they made a life here. He said, this is the land of opportunity, and this is where we're staying. For our listeners who have been to Italy, where was your family from? They were Italy? They were from northern Italy around Milan. I see. Very mm-hmm. good. Well, great. Well, you said you wanted to talk today a little bit about investment property. So tell us what's on your mind today. You know, they've been great for us, haven't they? They have provided great wealth for us, and it's amazing how they're all paid off. We've got streams of income. We've been able to do some great things with them, and even had to take some of our older properties and flip out of them, right? That's right. We've got 11 residential properties, and of course, you can always decide whether you want to invest in commercial or residential. We kind of went the residential option. We bought our first one in 1996. We just It was an assumable non-qualifying VA loan, and we just took over payments. Those don't exist anymore, do they? Isn't that amazing how you could just pay someone like $150 plus like their equity? I think we gave them like $10,000, paid 150 bucks, signed a letter. Hey, Mr. Mortgage Company, we'll make the payment. Don't worry about us. <laughs> and that's all there was to it. And that's not around anymore. But we've actually paid that property off. And now our kids live in that property, which has just been a great family legacy for us. You know, it's interesting because some of our properties are coming close to being fully depreciated. And the IRS allows you to write off the improvements on the lot as if they're going to be worth nothing after a period of time. And so that, you mean like the driveway and the mailbox? Or what are we talking about? We're talking about? about the structure. Oh, okay. And we're saying that if you have a residential property, probably 80% of the value of that property is in the structure and 20% in the land. Okay, that makes sense. So a $200,000 home, you're saying that 
the lot would be worth maybe forty thousand dollars, twenty percent, and probably the structure itself that could be written off if you'd pay two hundred thousand dollars, you'd be able to write off one hundred and sixty thousand dollars over how many years? Twenty-seven and a half years, and it's really kind of a paper loss because we all know that in twenty-seven and a half years, that property is probably going to be worth more. Yeah, but that paper loss is going to give you a benefit on your taxes, isn't that right? That's right, every year. So it's real positive for twenty-seven and a half years until it's quote fully depreciated. And then it's time to, what you said, flip out or exchange. And there is a segment of the IRS tax code called the 1031 exchange. It's a like-kind exchange, and it allows to identify three replacement properties and within a time period, close on one of those and defer your capital gains tax. Yeah, it is really interesting that when you close on this and you're selling like an older property, that you don't get to even put the money in your own bank account. You hire what's called an intermediary, because we've done this a couple of times. Yes, we have. And we've helped other people do this as well. Yeah, absolutely. So you hire an intermediary. Their fee is really reasonable. I think we've paid like $750. Mm -hmm. Gosh, that was 20 years ago, and it's still the same today when we did one recently. And the money goes into their account. We can't touch it. And that's part of the tax code that says you put that money in your own bank account, the IRS is going to tax you on that. That's that right. Now you've created a taxable event, and that's not what you want. Really, generally, you're going to identify three properties to purchase. You get a contract on the sale property. You've identified these three within 45 days, and then you have to close on them within 180 days of closing on your property. So I'm glad you brought this up today because we have, as you just told everyone, 11 residential properties. And I'm kind of getting tired of the residential gig. Now, for a lot of people, that's the way to go. Now that we've compiled 11 properties, I'm kind of interested in taking those 11 selling those all as one package because it'd be too hard to to sell each one individually and try to plan on closing dates and then flip into commercial. But I'm thinking that owning a commercial property might be better for us at this time. Let's talk for a minute about the positives and negatives of commercial versus residential. Can you do that? Well, you know, the upside of residential is it is easier to get into. And the fact is that it's easier if you need to liquidate because you've got a bigger buyer pool. You don't have to sell to investors. If you have a single residential property, you can sell it to an owner-occupied person. So let's back up there a minute. You said it's easier to get into. What do you mean about residential being easier to get into than commercial? Well, if you're going to try to buy a huge commercial building, you're going to have to have a much bigger investment. Well, sure. And you might even need partners to do that, That's right? right. So you might be looking at a real estate investment trust or a REIT. Otherwise, trying to get into a big commercial property all by yourself might be difficult. I think we also ought to distinguish how parents could go in and buy a home for a college-age student that was enrolled at least 12 hours full-time in school, mm-hmm. and they can go in and buy a home with the kiddos on an FHA loan with only 3.5% down, and that's a great way for someone to get into their first investment property with a very low down payment, right? That's right, and you know, the student doesn't have to have the income to support that payment, but the student does have to have good credit, so there are some requirements on that. One thing we might look at is multifamily like a duplex. You know, when you have a residential property and your tenants move out, you now have a mortgage payment if it's mortgaged, and that continues on. With a duplex, perhaps one of the tenants is out of the property, but not both at the same time. So you've got somebody helping you cover the payment. I think you've got a few rules that you've talked about in regard to what people ought to look for in a residential property to make it a better investment. Can you just run over a few of those? You know, there are. And as I look at multi-list and see things coming up, there are certain things I look for and I know you look for. And one of them is, this sounds kind of interesting, but it's a small interior lot. And when you think about a tenant, they're probably not going to want to mow a huge corner lot, right? So you don't go buy a rental with five acres, is that right? (laughs) Absolutely, because they're not going to take care of it. And probably no pool because of the liability and the maintenance and and no spa. We actually bought one that had a spa and had the spa taken out and all the pool equipment. Yeah, we were worried. I think one of those families had a younger child and we were just concerned about liability. That's right. And you know, I like properties that are less than 15 years old, even less than 10 years old because of the ease of maintenance. The mechanicals are newer, heat and air the hot water tank roof. Yeah, once you get to 15 to 18 years old, I mean, it sounds great to go buy one built in, say, 2005 today, because you look and say that's only 19 years old. Then again, I remember you and I selling our home seven, eight years ago, 
and it had 20-year-old heat and air. And we were just concerned that the buyer was going to crucify us with two water heaters and two HVAC systems that were all original. That's Fortunately, right. they checked out, but that could have been a potential liability for us. I mean, we didn't replace them because they didn't need to be replaced. That's right. They were in working order. But I think you have to be really careful about those homes that are 13 to 18 years old where the owner says, well, I haven't replaced it because they didn't need to. Yeah. And realize that at some point that's going to be a big capital expenditure. That's right. And you know, another thing that I look for is conformity. What is going to be most appealing to most tenants? The kind of neighborhood, the kind of floor plan. You want to appeal to the broad spectrum of folks because you're going to get more in terms of your ability to rent it and your rental income. You know, I look at the age of the roof. That is an important consideration. And also the floor coverings. Carpet is so expensive to replace. And when you have tenants in a property, probably you're going to have to replace that carpet every time a new tenant comes in. You know, we've really gone to that LVT or LVP, the Lifetime Vinyl Plank, which is a vinyl-looking material, or Lifetime Vinyl Tile. Right. They just hold up really well. How about the last thing here, Cindy, and that's financing. I know that home we bought in Edmond on Sugarloaf, we put that on a 10-year mortgage because we could afford that at that time. I think it rented for $1,400 a month at that time. Our payment was maybe $1,700 a month. So we, we ate it a little bit for a number of years along with the property management And that's fees. called a negative cash flow. Negative cash flow. But boy, did we paid that off so fast in 10 years. And now we're really reaping the benefit of that with higher rental rates in place. Talk to me a little bit about financing and how different it is here compared to California where you were. You know, when I was in California, and most of you know, I sold real estate there for eight years, and I always wanted to buy some residential investment properties. But there was so much negative cash flow because the rents just would not cover your property insurance, taxes, and principal and interest. So I never did it. And I got here and I was so excited that we could do that because you could break even or on one of these shorter AM schedules have just a little bit about ne- just a little negative cash flow. And you know, one thing to consider is when you have a 10 or 15 year loan, your overall interest rate's going to be a little lower. But the fact is because you're amortizing it over a shorter period of time, your payment is going to be higher. So it hurts a little bit. So here's the moral of the story for everyone. She didn't move here for for me because she'd really fallen in love with me that much. (laughs) She didn't move here for OU football because she's not a football (laughs) fan. She actually moved here because the rental property was more affordable, (laughs) the down payments were lower, and we could build wealth, which is what we've done. So there you go. Probably ought to get off that topic real quick. I want to remind everybody, Cindy, I've got my favorite 10 Christmas songs out, and we'd sure like you to check them out. You can go look at my music playlist at wallytalkshouses.com and find a lot of knowledge there. You can become, I mean, really a real estate expert by listening to the hundreds of topics we've talked about over the last two years. Happy Thanksgiving to everyone. We're glad to have you listen in today, and we'll talk to you again next week. And I will tell you in Italian, manja. This has been House Talk with Wally and Cindy Kerr, presented each week by Best Protect Roofing and Construction and by Chris Doak with Gateway Mortgage. Join us weekly to learn more about buying, selling, owning, and investing. And visit Wally Talks Houses to find all available podcasts and shows.